Well, welcome, welcome, Miss Ori. How Thank are you? you? I am well. How are you? Thank you for having me. You know you are welcome. It's an honor, a real honor to have you here on the Well-Centered Woman podcast. I'm very excited to hear your voice. You have that smooth voice in the clubhouse room, and you got all that <laughs> wisdom. And so we're going to extract some of that today. All right, I'm ready. It is an honor to be here. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And you are the resident behind the scenes therapist in our FBBL club. Mm -hmm. You work quietly behind the scenes, checking on folks, making sure they're okay. And, you know, I just want to know what inspired you to become a therapist. I, huh. <laughs> so way back in the day, and I, I think I'm about to age myself here. I was just about done with college. This was late 90s, early 2000s. And so, so I am Nigerian, right? And we all know in the Nigerian community, there are five, five <laughs> uh, career paths you can go down. Doctor, lawyer, <laughs> five, right? engineer, banker. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so I was supposed to be a doctor and I had a, about one semester left with my bio major and I just, something didn't feel right. Mm. It did not feel right. And I took it to prayer and I said, Lord, I don't know what this is, but I'm almost done. I don't like school. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> but I have a feeling this is not my path. Wow. And so if this is not my path, I'm going to need you to show me my path. And it took about a week or so. And every time I walked down the quad or sat in the cafeteria, and I also worked in the cafeteria, I worked in the Unity Center, I realized that people would forever tell me their life stories. I'm like, why y'all feel the need to tell me your life story? I don't even like people like that. Why y'all gotta come talk to me? And it was like the Holy Spirit said, because that's what you're supposed to be doing. I'm said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what do you mean? That's what I'm supposed to be doing. So I said, what does that mean? And he was like, that's what you're supposed to be doing. So I said, okay. And I did the research because I didn't know what, what that meant. So I did the research and turns out psychology was going to be it because, well, people talk to people who have psychology degrees. I had no idea what it was going to blossom into. No idea what the future held. I just knew I had a switch to be a psych major. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And true to form, all my family was like, ah, what are you doing? Why did you switch? Hey, are you going to be in America forever? What are you supposed to do with a psychology degree? And I said, <laughs> and I said, well, I prayed on it. This is God. You can argue with God, but this is it. Furthermore, y'all Nigerians, y'all need therapy the most. So let's talk about that. <laughs> and <laughs> so I ended up in school for another additional year so the good news is a lot of the uh, classes the other prerequisites and all the other you know electives and everything I took were classes that would have worked if I had a psych major so basically I could have finished a psych minor that's how many classes so I only ended up in school for another year well and extra semester and a half because they lost 15 credits but that's another story for another day and so that's how I got on this journey I, I went to school I finished I graduated and then nothing <laughs> I worked in the field forever really and 10 years later after divorce and being back to base I went back to school for my master's and here I am here you are. And that theme of how you paused. And I like how you were, you 
were self-aware enough and were sensitive sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit to, to feel that nudge, like, this is not what I'm supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And that would have been a pretty young age. I was very young. Oh. So I was, so I graduated high school at 16, going on 17. I took a, a break mm-hmm. and then I went to school. So I was, I was 20, 20. Yeah, I think I was about 20, 21. And you Maybe obeyed. not even 21. I think 20. And you obeyed that prompting that said, this is not right. And you waited. Mm-hmm. And you mm-hmm. paid attention for the signs and noticed how, yeah, how people mm-hmm. always want to spill out all their beans and all their guts to you. Mm-hmm. Man, Which thing. was weird to me. Like, it's a, like, like, do I have a right. sign upside my head that says, tell me all your business? Because I've had it. that happen to me, too. That was part of the signs that had me, like, pursuing the path of being a life, life coach. Mm-hmm. People would just corner me in my cubicle or I'd be in my office at work. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm in the finance area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They would come in there. Tanika, I need to talk to you. Close close my door. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I know very well. So I think that's really important for those who will listen just to follow that prompting yes. right there. And know? don't be afraid. Because I thought about it. I was like, oh my God, what's my family going to say? What's my mom going to say? What's my Worry dad going to say? It was, and I, and I was young. I mean, yeah, I, I was young. And I was like, oh my God, I am not ready for the backlash. But once I knew that it was God and I had that peace, there was nothing anybody could say. Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to shift a minute Mm -hmm. because now we're going to go a little deeper. Mm -hmm. Miss Glory. So, you know, as you guys know, she is the founder of Amara Consulting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I did my little research. (laughs) And on your website, there are a couple of statements, and, and we got to dig into this. this yeah, right here, I knew this was where, coming. You knew it. You knew it. For you are referring to yourself in the third person. <laughs> <laughs> and the well-centered w- women in our community, in our collective, we want to know, and we're not going to let you glide past this in the third person, because we know it's you, lady. We know. <laughs> this is what you said a few years ago. Mm-hmm. She, meaning you, she <laughs> went through a situation that completely pulled the rug out from under her. She had been through many situations before. This one was a doozy and mm. she was stuck. Mm. Pray tell as you're comfortable. We need to know. <laughs> you got to give us the tea. <laughs> well, and how you partnered with Holy Spirit? This seems like you went to hell and back and back again. I mean, it was a big I did. Just was sliding under mm. you. So what happened? I did. So I was. I mean, I was a newlywed for all intents and purposes. Two and a half years into marriage, and my husband woke up one morning and disappeared and came back a week later and said he was done. Hmm. Ma'am, I had a two-year-old baby. <laughs> ah, yeah, that was it. That face right there, yeah, that was it. That was it. So that face you woke up when your right husband now. wakes up. So tell us, I mean, a little bit. So prior to that, of course, with, you know, any marriage you know you have your ups and your downs but you know we're generally okay but about a year and a half in things were just not right like I would get phone calls and people from home would call me and say is everything okay with you guys we're like what are you talking about of course we're fine Mm -hmm. and you know we'd have conversation and he'd say are you happy and I'd say technically I'm not but you know this is what I need you to do to fix it. And then we would, we'd be fine. But uh, he had a, he had a gig. But yeah, he had a gig. And so he had to travel. And, you know, the goal was that when he came back, he would go on a honeymoon because we never had one. 
well mm. on that trip things turned sour and he decided to pick a fight and i said listen i don't fight but if you want to fight when you come back we can fight but i don't fight over the ocean <laughs> He hated my mouth. I had a mouth on me. Listen, <laughs> I don't cuss, but I can touch you. Okay. And uh, after that trip was when he came back and things were just done, I guess, at that point. But I was praying and fasting and doing all of the above. And uh, one of my sister friends from my prayer group, uh, we were praying one day and she said, if the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I said, oh, hmm. I kept it and I kept going. Not too long after that. This is all while I was praying and fasting. By the way, I'm talking, I'm 30 days in at this point. I was teaching on the book of Job at church. And I heard the question, if... I took away everything. Would you still serve me? I said, I'm sorry, what? I'm in a beloved teacher. You gonna ask me that question? And I said, well, yeah, where else would I go? I can't serve anybody else. I kid you not. So that was January to February. And in February ish, March ish was when he went on the trip, came back in April, right before the boy's birthday, and everything fell apart. I'm talking months. Everything fell apart. Yeah. Wow. <sighs> yeah. Mm. I came home one Sunday and he was gone. I just thought he wasn't home. But I heard the uh, sudden look around. So I looked around and clothes were gone. I was like, oh, maybe he's doing laundry. Look. Look. So I pulled apart drawers and everything. I went to look at where he kept his important documents and everything was gone. And it was like, you know how when you have shutters and you just kind of lift the shutters? Mm -hmm. I felt like that's exactly what happened. Like something kind of might, it was like blinders were lifted. And I mm. just knew and I said, he's gone. He's gone. Yeah. So that was the doozy. That was the wow. That was, wow. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. And I note that you were fasting and praying and you had that word, you know, if the foundation's not there, that scripture. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you heard the voice, a still small mm -hmm. question, if you take everything. And you were teaching, so you're teaching at church, mm -hmm. in church, fasting and praying and this marriage still dissolved. Mm -hmm. Well, we could, we don't have time on the podcast. <laughs> to do, to it's, go a whole, there. it's a whole show that with a several whole, parts. Yes. 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 So by this point, you would have been already in the mental health field, right? So I hadn't. <laughs> funny enough, I had just gone to the the local college there, so that was in California, mm -hmm. and I was just having discussions about, hey, if I want to do my master's, what do I need? So yes, I had been in the field, but I wasn't a therapist yet. I was working with people with severe, you know, what we call SBMI, severely persistently mentally ill. I'm talking the heavy stuff, schizophrenia, but those are the kids, people I was working with, adults at that point. So I was not a therapist yet, but I was in the field and I had been for a few years. So I had not gone back for my master's yet. So that obviously had to be put on pause. Mm -hmm. while I had to gather my life. <laughs> you had to partner with the Holy Spirit. Oh, he's such a wonderful life. partner. Oh, I lost it for all of one week, though. Oh, Tell yeah. us about that. 
because see someone's listening thinking just because they lost it for a week that they've lost their religion they've lost yeah you're gonna get it back god will you're gonna get it back you ain't really lost it i remember what i used to say when i got out of that you know i i i I was having a conversation and i said to someone i said i had insurance i had insurance in the kingdom i had been serving god since my youth that was my insurance I have to cash in on my policy. So I did. And he came through. Come on. I lost it. My body was failing me. My mind was (laughs) doing its own thing. And my mom was there. Oh, my mother. My mother had come to visit. And after everything fell apart, she said, I knew something was wrong, but you never said a word. So I had to come see for myself and keep you supported. And she, man, yeah, my mom's been my rock. <laughs> man, hey man, he never said a word. During this whole process, when he moved out, you didn't tell a soul? She was there. So when she had come to visit so i was already praying and fasting so january february she had come to visit then he went on the trip and he asked her to stay because it was supposed to be a short trip he asked her to stay so that she can watch the boy while we went on our honeymoon when he got back so that's why my mom was there for as long as she was which ended up working out for my good anyway so because then all that happened after he got back Wow, so yep. God had, was already looking out for you because, see, it wasn't was. a surprise to him. Oh, no, nothing it wasn't was a surprise, surprise to him. Do we clear, think? Come on. We think it is, but it's not. I'm going to tell you more what happened. So after about a week of losing it, I woke up on Sunday morning, and I went to church. And I got to church, and I prayed. And I said, oh, so hmm. the day he left, I had a job interview. So, yeah, so he, he left on Sunday night. I had a job interview Monday morning. He came back Monday morning and said he was done. But I was getting ready for my interview. I still wanted my interview. Don't ask me how, but I did. I know how to compartmentalize so well. And that's something I like to teach people. You have, sometimes you have to compartmentalize just so you can function. Then you come back and unpack. Not everything needs to be unpacked in a moment. You can shelve it and do what needs to be done. Then you come back. And that's what I did. So I went on my interview. I came back. And, and I went to church on Sunday. And I prayed and I told God that if I get the interview, no, no, prior to Sunday, I said, if I get the job, then that means I'm meant to stay in California. If I don't get the job, then I'm meant to leave. Well, I didn't get the job. So then Sunday I went to church and I said, well, I haven't prayed all week, but here I am. (laughs) I didn't get the job. So that means I got to go. Well, I ain't got a dime to my name, so I'm going to need you to provide. And he said, and I heard one of the first few times that I've actually ever heard the audible voice of God. And he said, change your prayer. You need more than money. Yes, I kid you not. I kid you not. See, God wants us to be specific. We say it all the time, but this was my proof. You got to be specific with God. You tell him what you want. So I said, huh, okay. So I said, well, whatever I need to get out of here, I need you to provide for me. So that's it. I went home. And that night, or was it the next morning, I checked my email and this wonderful soul my friend's aunt had sent me an email. Mind you, I met this lady once. Well, yeah, one day once, but 
over a period of months. We were planning my friend's bridal shower when I met her, but we had done everything by email because it was a surprise. Mm -hmm. So that's how she had my email address still. And she said, you've been on my mind, please call me. Mm -hmm. So I called her and she said, you've been on my mind, are you okay? And then I told her everything. And she said, I need you to find your way to my office tomorrow or sometime this week. And I said, okay, ma'am, I will. And so I called one of my friends from church because I didn't have a car. So I was like, oh, that's another story. Anyways, we don't have enough time. So I called my friend from church. I said, listen, I need a ride. I need you to pick me up. And she did. And I went to this lady's office and I'm telling you, this auntie wrote me a check for fifteen hundred dollars, one thousand five hundred. If I tell you that is exactly how much I needed to book a plane ticket for me, my son, and the fees on my mom's ticket, put my stuff in storage, and get out of California, I'd be lying. That's exactly how much I needed. Look at God, ma'am. Girl, you got some history with God. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, Jesus. yes, I do. Girl, that'll make me cry. <laughs> I'm trying to have more work stuff. I'm trying to be professional. <laughs> it gets better, but we don't have time. But that's my doozy. So that's my doozy. That's and that's how and I that partner is... with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. That's your doozy. Mm. That's what we need to hear more of right there. That mm -hmm. right my God. And that segues right into my next question, <laughs> which is also on your website. <laughs> <laughs> you have this lovely statement that says, I am Ori Lua. I am not my past. Mm -hmm. I am not my story. I mm -hmm. am not my trials. I am mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. It is a reminder to myself not to lose myself no matter where my journey through life takes me. Mm -hmm. Somewhere out there, there's a godly woman who's had her identity tangled up with all of the old stories, the dramas and the traumas and the mistakes of the past. Mm. There's somebody out there who experienced what you experienced. And one of the lies that the enemies plant to your head is when a man packs his bags and leaves. And I know I got my own story. Mm. You come mm. home and their stuff is gone. Happened mm -hmm. to me too. Mm. Now we got an abandonment wound that's all that's stirred mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. The rejection, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. What would you tell a lady that's just heard your story right now that may be sitting in that same spot? Now she's thinking her identity is tied up in that whole story about why that man left and was wrong with her and this, that, and the third. If I choose to not eat chocolate cake, does that mean something is wrong with chocolate cake or it's just not my preference? It's just not my preference. It's not your preference. Bingo. If he chooses to leave, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. You just stop being his preference. And that's his loss. And that's his loss. Oh, girl, you preach it today. <laughs> Understand that your value does not come from your story. It doesn't come from your experience. It comes from, your value comes directly from the throne of heaven. You are worth dying for. Are you kidding me? You're not an orphan. Do you know who your daddy is? Let me tell you something. It's me. <laughs> People look at me sometimes and like, oh, you're so conceited. No, I'm not. I'm just very confident in who my daddy is. Amen. I don't have to worry about you liking me. I spent way too many years worried about other people. What are they going to say? What are they going to think? Oh, I thought she was a Christian. She left her husband's house. Oh, I thought she was this. Her husband left her. She was, listen, people will judge you, talk about you, look at you through their own lens. Culture, trauma, experience, jealousy, envy, whatever it is. 
that ain't got nothing to do with you. Nothing. A jack squat. So the earlier we realize that, the better our lives become. The freer we are to live our lives and not worry. Because you're not for everyone anyway. You're not. Not everybody likes chocolate cake. Hell, you can like chocolate cake tomorrow and not like it the day after. So don't worry about it. If you've made mistakes, figure out what you did wrong. Learn from it and move on. There's no need to dwell on it. You can't change it anyway. The past is in the past. We can't change it. We cannot change history. However, we can rewrite history. Why? Today is tomorrow's past. So we can start today to make better decisions that will give us a better future and a better history. So when you look back, you can go, oh, yeah, I can't change my past, but I can rewrite history. Come on now. You, Amen. you can't change it. Why are you dwelling on it? Past. Why sit in it? I sent it. And I love the analogy you said, you know, how people are looking at you. Somebody can look at look at you through the lens of their trauma, through the mm-hmm. lenses of jealousy, through the lenses mm-hmm. of their traditional mindsets, through the lenses of yeah. various judgments and preferences. And they're mm-hmm. not the see they're not seeing your value and the truth of who you are authentically because they're seeing you through these faulty, dirty lenses. And then we'll Same personalize it. Glass. Stained glass, and then we personalize it and internalize it and get shame and unworthiness all because someone else is looking at you sideways through their dirty lens. There you go. And then you want to work to please everybody. And Do you know how many times you're going to have to change in one day? To please everybody? To please everybody? That's demonic. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot. Oh my goodness, we could talk even more about this because you dropped some wisdom. You dropped a lot of wisdom. Oh, that's so much. Oh, we don't have enough time. Mm-hmm. Now, my next question is, you you are faith-based clearly, mm-hmm. but you are also a therapist, you're a counselor. Mm-hmm. So could you tell us or describe a little to us about your process of incorporating sound psychology and therapeutic practices mm-hmm. with your faith? How, in your clients and in your own life, how do you do that? How do you merge that? Well, honestly, it's pretty easy. So psychology is a science. Yes, it's a soft science. We know some people think it's, but no, science has proven quite a few things, right? So I just use what works. The things that we know work, yeah, we use those. What do you need? What helps your mind become free and clear? What we call coping mechanisms. Do you meditate? Do you pray? What do you do when you have anxious thoughts? How do you handle them? You divide them up. You talk through them. You look at what you can control. You fix those. And what you can't control, you let go. All of that stuff. I incorporate all of that. And when I'm dealing with someone who is up, because they will tell you, Mm -hmm. then you put that stuff in. Then I take all of those and say, let me show you how scripture already tells us this. Let me show you where. This is it. I just told you when you wake up every morning and you've been practicing it, you've been meditating, you've been speaking positively over yourself, what we call positive affirmations. You've been doing thought stopping techniques. Here are your scriptures. When the scripture says to pull down every stronghold, 2 Corinthians 10, you do that. When it says to think on things that are pure, of good report, praiseworthy, that's in Philippians. There you go. When the Bible tells you the death and life and the power of the tongue, that's Proverbs. So when you wake up every morning and you speak positively over yourself, go to the scriptures. So it works whether or not you're a Christian. Now, the difference is it's lasting when you incorporate the word. Why? Because it's quick, it's powerful, it's active. It's a lie. The Holy Spirit helps you. And the truth of the word cements it for you. Amen. So good. So good. It's like the scripture just backs up the science. <laughs> it literally just reinforces science, the science. Science has said 
that when you speak positively over yourself, when you hear it, right, your brain actually uh, recalibrates itself, right? And it starts to look for the positive. When all you speak is negative, then that's all you're going to see. It doesn't matter. So when the Bible tells you to renew your mind daily by the word, that's what really? it's talking about. Really? It's neuroscience, right? <laughs> it's all up in there. It is science. It's there. It's there. <laughs> it's there. So, wow, this is so, so rich. There's so much here. So we're going to transition to the business side on your mm. business hat. So we got a good foundation of your story, your background, how you're incorporating faith with therapy, just mm. the lenses we look at from trauma and overcoming. But now, you know, you started Amara Consulting. You're in the faith-based business-driven leaders club for a reason. Mm, mm-hmm, 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 <laughs> because mm-hmm. you do have a business. I do. <laughs> so, when you decided to step out, like, okay, I'm going to get out here on Instagram, and my name is Ori in my pocket. I need to ask where that came from. First. <laughs> what triggers and emotions or past traumas that came up or had to be dealt with when you stepped out to, like, really, okay, I'm going to bust out with Amara Consulting, or in my pocket, <sighs> I'm going to have these blogs. When you got in your feelings, what did it cost you? What did you do? You know how you told me I was hiding earlier? <laughs> That's what it was for me because a lot of people did not and still don't know my story. I said nothing. They just knew that my marriage did not work out. I mean, the other side had a lot to say, but I never said a word. If you were close to me, you knew. So me stepping out meant that the world would have to know my story. And there was a part of me that did not want that. And it I'm still trying to figure out why, but I think part of it was still trying to protect the other party. Why for the life of me? I don't know. But then there's also a part of me that's like, well, we don't air our dirty laundry. Mm. But then there's the part of me that goes, well, if you don't accept it, you know what it is work through it it will forever hold you hostage and there's nothing to be ashamed of girl don't let so that's, that's why i bust it out said you've got to bust it out we need more of this story because it's out now girl it sure is. <laughs> it sure is. It sure is. But yes, Amara Consulting came. Amara means grace, actually, in one of the languages in Nigeria, the Igbo language. I'm Yoruba, but I chose Igbo anyway. And uh, I chose grace because that's what I got. It's grace. Grace is what carried me through, and grace is what I'm offering to my clients. It's there. Just take it. Just take that grace. Take that grace for yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm. And you know what? That whole thing, you had two points as to why you were holding back on your story. Number one, some of it is protecting the other party. And number two, not wanting to air your dirty laundry. Mm-hmm. That's culture. Through, yeah, that's the culture, right? Um, I had that with my first book, Get Out of That Dating Relationship. Now, I was mm-hmm. afraid that if I published it, because the per- per- person involved was a, a former pastor, mm-hmm. and I, you know, I got to know his true his his children well. Mm-hmm. and had poured into them with the idea that we were going to get married mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and when it didn't work out if I wrote the book I'm like well, if they see it even yeah. though we're totally not connected they're yep. not paying me any attention no one's paying but I was so petrified that what mm-hmm. if he randomly googles me mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. finds the book and reads it and realizes I'm talking about him what's going to mm-hmm. happen then yeah. I realized he's not going to do anything mm-hmm. He's not going to do anything because if he were, then everybody would know it was him and see how crazy he really was. (laughs) (laughs) 
and it'll be more embarrassing for him to admit that it was him than for him to keep his mouth shut. Mm-hmm. So that that and I I just had to trust God and I got over it. And then the mm-hmm. other thing, the dirty laundry. Mm-hmm. I decided I you tell what you want to tell. Mm-hmm. You pick the parts in your story and you tell it in a way that's still graceful, that's truthful, and that's authentic, but not in a dirty laundry way. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how I had to deal with that. Mm. And I, I, then I wanted to look at it from the side of who's missing, who needs this story, and who am I blocking up in their purpose and in their healing progress because I'm sitting up here scared of a few little bits of my little dirty laundry. Mm. And there's probably generations and other women that are struggling all because I'm trying to be hoarding in my little ego and my little mm. flesh. Mm. And then that's mm-hmm. what made me move. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's what made mm-hmm. me move. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So tell me this. What is the biggest challenge you're facing in your business right now? And how are you how are you tackling it? Well, I'm only one person. <laughs> uh, and I have a limited time. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that limits how many people I can see. And I have a full time job. So that's my biggest challenge. And scaling up would require me not working full time. And that, that's not an option right now. I understand. So it's just your time capacity and your constraints is Mm -hmm. your biggest issue. Like how to scale, how to build out a market consulting without compromising the fact that you still need that full time check. That's a real place. And people don't want to admit that. You did. I know. It's a real real place. It's a real place. And you can't afford to just jump out, jump stupid. (laughs) No, you can't. You better have a plan. You got to have a plan. You You got to have a plan. plan. I got way too many people depending on that paycheck. <laughs> and so, and I think this current culture kind of stigmatizes and makes you feel some kind of way. Like, why ain't you out here? Why? Well, I made $1,000 overnight. Wonderful. I made six <laughs> figures in six months. I'm glad for you. I'm so happy for you. Yeah. But I'm in my own race, in my own lane. Mm. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And then at some point, it's like we have to cross a certain threshold and and make some decisions and make some de- determinations that enough is enough, and relying on the Holy Spirit to like, okay, so what do we need to really, really do? Because it's like you're, it's, it's the tension of, you know, you need to keep that full time job, but there, there's a time element involved mm-hmm. and a resource element involved in building it out without mm-hmm. losing your sanity, yeah. <laughs> your health, <laughs> yes. burning yourself out. And that's very easy in this field. Very, oh my God. very easy the nature of your work requires mm-hmm. you to have a degree of equilibrium or some type of a, which gets into our next thing. Um, well, before I get into that, you know, this is a question that you can know, I know you thought about because you heard it on the other one. <laughs> <laughs> but I asked this one first, what keeps you, we are on the Wealth Center Woman podcast. So what are the main things that keeps you, you know, balanced at peace and emotional and spiritual equilibrium? What is the number one practice that you do, Ori? as a professional therapist and businesswoman? Well, I remind myself every day that balance is bogus and life is a pie chart. Well, wait a minute now. We need to write this down. (laughs) Balance is bogus. Mm. And life is a pie chart. Say it again one more time for the people in the back. Balance is bogus. Life is a pie chart. Now break it down. When we think of balance, everyone gets, oh my God, I didn't get to do enough of this. Oh my God, I let that slide. Oh my God, I dropped that. And we start to bug out. 
If we, however, remember that we're not on a seesaw, life is a pie chart. When you look at a pie chart, mm -hmm. different sections have different percentages. So depending on the season you are in life, something's going to have 5%, something's going to have 80%. Something's going to have 0.25 and so on and so forth. As you shift, those percentages change. And it's okay. It's not going to be this way forever. You do what you can and you keep going. Amen. I love that. So what's your pie chart looking like? I, in my mind, I see your pie chart. Mm -hmm. FDBL, a percent. Your full time job, a percent. America, mm -hmm. certainly. Mm -hmm. Consulting, a percent. Your fam, like, what is your pie chart? Like my pie chart right now looks like FDBL, which has shrunk a little bit mm -hmm. as I <laughs> acclimate to my new job. <laughs> uh, my family mainly my, my, my kids. So I have many children, but I birthed one. So there's one that lives in my house. He's 14. Whew, long time from two. And uh, he gets a little sliver of that chart because he's also at a stage where he's starting to figure out life for himself. And he's pretty independent and has been for a minute. And that's one of the side effects of being a child to a single mom who had to work full time, go to school full time and all of that. So he gets a little sliver and every week I adjust that. That gets adjusted weekly. Some things get adjusted monthly. That, that adjusts weekly, depending on where he's and where I am. My church activities and everything else, that's pretty standard because you know, mm -hmm. it don't change. I only go to church on a Sunday because well, COVID. <laughs> So everything else is online right now. So that's easy for me. And then everything else just gets adjusted. Um, I love to read. That's my downtime. Your self-care part of your pie yep. chart is really important. Yep. I love to read. So that gets a big chunk now. I, <laughs> I love to sleep. <laughs> sleep is important. I'm going to listen, well-centered women people. I'm going to tell you right now, if you do nothing else for yourself, make sure you sleep. Mm -hmm. Sleep is after water. <laughs> sleep is probably the most important thing we can do for our mental wellness. Mm -hmm. You have to sleep. You have to drink water and eat right. But if you can't. Drink water and sleep. At least do that. Get your At sleep. least do that. And drink your water. Y'all hear that? Drink your water. Stay hydrated and go mm -hmm. to sleep. That's go to that's sleep. Lori. She. That's it. Balance is bogus. Your life is a pie chart. Drink your water and go to sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Adjust your numbers weekly if you need to. Adjust them <laughs> monthly, but give yourself grace. You heard it from a therapist. That's the formula right there. That's it. That's, That's it. it. And yeah. I never, ever skimp on my time with God. Sometimes it's shorter. You know, sometimes it's not in the morning. It's sometime in the middle of the day or at night before I go to bed. But I don't skimp out on it. That's important, too. He's the biggest. Well, he's holding the pie together. Honey. Listen, he holds my whole pie together. I put something out on Twitter the other day. I said, listen, life will throw a wrench in your souffle. You better make sure God is one holding your little ceramic bowl together. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This is so much. You gave so much rich wisdom. I'm going to have to think about it. You said some stuff up in here. <laughs> so this is my last question. Well, next to the last one. If you could give yourself, your 18-year-old self some advice, what would you mm. tell 18-year-old Ori? And that from the perspective of your age now, given all you've been through, the doozy that took the rug out from under you and your journey, what would you tell her? Life is not that serious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Life is not that serious. Have fun. Have fun. Stop trying to check all the boxes. Just have fun. What else would you tell them? You better hold God like he's running away, even though he's not. Cling. Hold on to God. Cling to him. When everything else falls apart, be steady. Amen. That sums it up. Enjoy mm -hmm. your life. It's not that serious. It's not that serious. Thank it you. really isn't. Mm. Life is going to happen. You either go through it kicking and screaming or you relax. It's going to happen anyway. You can stress through it, or you do what you know works, mm. and you relax. Either we trust God or we don't. There you go. Either the word is true or it's not. There you go. That's Either it. That's, come on now. That's it. You do what you can. You look at everything. You do what you can. Let go of the stuff you can't, and you'll pray about everything. Such profound wisdom, Miss Ori Nichols. <laughs> so, how can folks get in contact with you? What do you have going on? And how can our folks connect with you? Well, I can only offer therapy in the state of Rhode Island right now, and actually, some states. We had uh, all the COVID protocols dropped because when COVID happened. We could actually practice it across state lines, which means it can happen. They choose just to not let it happen anyway. But some states still uphold it, such as California, Indianapolis, New York, and I believe my state. But I am only licensed in the state of Rhode Island. So yeah, I just have therapy going on right now. I do have a blog on my website, Amara Consulting, LLC dot com read up on my blog hit me up on social media or in my pocket <laughs> Tell me about that you know i need to ask how did you wind up being in a pocket or in my pocket came about from one of my clients and i told her that i would use it and anytime she hears it she should just know that she's the one and she goes i'll take it and she said every time she was having a bad moment or she went to go do something she would say to herself, well, what would Ori tell you to do right now? And she said, it's like almost like I had a little Ori in my pocket. And I was like, damn, I'm going to take that. <laughs> so guys, get you some of that. You want yeah. Ori in your pocket? If you're listening from Rhode Island, there's a, you can have Ori in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> or you can follow her on Instagram at Ori in my pocket. And Twitter. <laughs> and Twitter. And Twitter. Where it has been a pleasure to interview you. And it's been so much. I, it's going to take me a minute because, you know, I like to go back and re listen. And I pick know. Up the nuggets. But this was wonderful, wonderful. So I'm so glad. Thank you for having me. You are so welcome. It was a joy to have you.